rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us, lives in us. Hey, welcome to Waterloo from Memphis Church Outdoor Backyard Worship Time Together. I want to do something that we have not done in over a year and a half. Meet and greet. Yay. Exactly. Could we just stand up and I don't care if you want to give a fist bump or a hi or whatever. Can you just greet those around you and say, I'm so glad I see you in person. <laughs> hey, welcome back. Hey, there are some chairs up front in the shade. If you're looking for a chair in a shady spot, there's chairs there. There is a cooler of water. I don't want anyone passing out because it is kind of warm. Uh, if you need a glass of water or in the church lobby, there's water as well. So. Those couple of quick announcements for you. As you're settling back down, I hope you all have a bulletin because I hope you can see that in the bulletin, the building fund hit a new record level this week. 250, a quarter of a million dollars. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We received the $15,000 check from the Upton Foundation, so that number just got added in. So we still have another 9000 coming from the other foundation uh, grant money, but uh, we have the $15,000 check. And Monday morning, they deliver the steel to start erecting the building. It'll take about to the end of the June, 1st of July, and the outer shell will be up. And so we'll watch and see how God provides in amazing ways uh, along the way. Just amazing. So thank you for your generous giving. There is a box on the tree uh, for offering, or you can do it online through a church website, wfmchurch.org. Uh, and we will be outside if the weather permits uh, during this time. I said to Perry, I said, Perry, we could be in the air conditioning today. He nope. said, no, 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 no. We're outside. We're outside. Uh, we are going to do a time capsule. Uh, Bruce Kibler is going to head it up for me. Uh, so if you have any thoughts about a time capsule, maybe something that should go in it or shouldn't go in it or whatever, see Bruce. I can direct you to Bruce. Bruce, you want to wave your hand? Where's Bruce? There he is. Bruce is back over there. Um, he can help with that as well. Uh, we're off for the summer with Bible study for the youth group and the adult Bible study. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to do a membership class. If you're interested in the membership class, on the bottom of your bulletin is a, like a little prayer request thing. Just write membership class, put your name on it, and you can put that in the box also or give that to me to make sure that we have enough uh, uh, handouts and workbooks for that membership class next Sunday, and I can help with times and all that kind of stuff. We would like to honor our graduates at this time. The crazy part of Two out of three of them are not here because one's working, one's gone to moms, and so, uh, but we still want to honor them. Uh, so, Rhonda, do you want to come and represent your daughter, Bailey? And where's Caleb? I saw Caleb pull in. Caleb, get out of the car. Come on, man. Come up front here. This is mom. Uh, Miss Bailey has uh, graduated from Coloma High School, and she's going to Southwestern uh, College uh, to do nursing to follow her mom's footsteps. Is that correct? Well, I'm x-ray. Your x-ray. It, it's still medical, and so grandma, my mom. grandma was a, okay. Perfect, perfect. So, uh, congratulations. Will you pass that on to her? This is a Bible for her, uh, a road map for her life. Uh, Coloma, uh, Kaylee, uh, uh, Price is uh, she had to take off to go with her mom to Indiana. She graduated on Friday at Waterville, and she's going to she wants to be a veterinarian. Uh, so she's starting off at the community college and wanting to be a veterinarian Sunday. And I was able to meet with her on Friday and pray with her and give her a Bible. And by the way, I got to see the baby. I got to see the baby, the baby boy, little Peyton. He's home doing great. Uh, and I was hoping they'd be here today so I could show him off, but they wouldn't let me touch him. So, uh, but grandma got to touch him and hold him. So congratulations to Kaylee as well. And then Caleb, Caleb is graduating also. And, uh, we just want to give you a Bible and give to your daughter as well and just say thank you. And we're praying for you as a church family. And that's the big part of it. We are praying for our graduates as they step into this next stage of life that God would just lead and direct you in the days ahead. Okay? Thanks, guys. Thank you. You know it. 1 Peter 5, 7. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you.
Father, we are amazed, overwhelmed, thankful that we get to worship you in your sanctuary today. And to think about your name, your son Jesus, what a powerful name, the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Father, we, we are thankful for our graduates, and we pray for them, that you would encourage them and strengthen them, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and power, that they would be armed with the armor of God to stand against the battle, the enemy, and all the trials they'll face in the days ahead. So, Father, we pray for them and their protection and their family as they take off on this new stage of life. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing in our church family and how you're working in your amazing, amazing hand as you walk with us day by day. Father, continue to be with those that are sick. Uh, Debbie Barton's father that fell, he's doing well, but we continue to pray that you bring healing. Thank you that uh, little Peyton's home from the hospital and they're doing well as well. Uh, help them to continue to grow and get stronger day by day. Be with Guy Leach in his shoulder, strengthen his body, give the doctors wisdom. Father, we thank you for a healing hand uh, as Lance had eye surgery, that he's here today. And thank you, Father, for walking with us day by day, moment by moment. We pray for our missionaries that share, share the good news of the gospel around the world. Thank you for our men and women that serve in our military, that we can worship in freedom today. We don't have to look over our shoulder. We don't have to worry about who's going to show up. Thank you, Father, for what you give to us. And we pray for our country during this time, our leaders, as they make decisions. But Father, today we pray that your word would speak to our hearts. Speak, give us a mind to comprehend your word today and a heart to receive it in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, we're gonna be in 1 Samuel in just a minute. 1 Samuel 16 and 17. Uh, today being Graduate Sunday, I wanna to talk to the grads, but you know what? We're all graduates, aren't we? It might be graduation from elementary school or preschool. Maybe it's a graduation in a job. Graduation, if we define it in the terms of graduation, is a step to the next stage. Ooh. Right? Isn't that? And it might be a retirement step. Pam just retired. She stepped from work to retirement. Uh, Dwayne, a couple of months ago, stepped from work to retirement. Uh, Donna for Donna did that a couple a year or so ago, whatever. And I don't know who, el who else has just retired. Uh, but there's many who have just stepped from one stage to another stage. And that's graduation. You move from here to a new phase of life, a new step of life. And some graduates have chosen to go on to college. Some have decided to join the workforce and get a J-O-B and uh, join the workforce, or maybe they join the Air Force, I don't know, uh, but they step from one place to another. Maybe some graduates have even decided, hey, I'm not going to school, I'm not going to the military, I'm not going to get a job, I'm going to start a family, get married and start a family. Who knows? What is the next step? How do we get from here to there, that next step? Uh, and some people do it like flawlessly, like it's no big deal, they just wander into it and it's, it's not a big deal, and others stumble through those phases of life. College isn't for everyone. I know people that take a year off, they travel the world or whatever, and then they go to college or do something different as far as that goes. But learning from our failures is just as important of learning from our successes. I know there's been times in my life I look back and my failures are some of my biggest learning times of life. Uh, Ben's not here today, but uh, he learned that he, after he first got married, they moved to Arkansas with, uh, with his new wife, Jamie, and uh, he was selling uh, cars. Ben selling cars. And it was, it was crazy. He was very successful at it, but he hated every minute of it. It was right when the government had the cash for clunkers. You could show up, and they would don't give you like $5,000 for a junker, and you could buy a new car. And he, it was very successful, but he hated it. Learning what you don't want to do in life is just as important as learning what you want to do in life. So graduation is moving from one stage to another stage. But so often, life throws you a curveball. A curveball. A curveball is a baseball analogy. It is when the ball 
is right there on the tee and you are ready to hit it and it's right there and it's in your sweet spot and you know that you can hit a home run. I saw a kid just yesterday, my grandson just missed a home run yesterday. It was it was it was just foul. That's all, just a little bit foul. But it was right there and hit in his sweet spot, and boom, and away it went. But so often, life throws us a curveball, and a curveball is when it's right there in front of you, and it moves. Uh, the spin of the ball, the wind moves it a little bit. The twist of your hand. And I never could throw a curveball, but it's coming right there. And it's going to be right at the sweet spot, and all of a sudden, boom, it moves, and you swing and miss. And I watched some of those kids swing and miss yesterday, too. And before you know it, it moves. And life throws us a curveball. It's what we expected or what we wanted isn't in front of us like we thought it was. It's, it's no longer right there. It, it drops. It, it moves. And life moves. And we miss. In graduation, there's times that you're getting ready to graduate. You are all set. And you realize you are missing a test a paper that didn't get turned in, uh, some type of project, maybe a speech before you can graduate. And all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, what do I do now? Each class, each test, each paper that you did, each speech that you gave prepared you for the next step. Just like in our lives, even those that have been out of college for a long time and out of school for a long time, each step has gotten us ready for the next step. And oftentimes, we don't look at it that way. We don't think about it that way. But what you learned in kindergarten or preschool got you ready for first grade. And that got you ready for middle school. And that got you ready for high school. And what you learned in high school got you ready for college. And what you learned in college got you ready for life. I was going to do a survey. Does anybody, has anybody learned anything in college? Those that went to college, did you learn anything in college that you still use today that is like, man, that is so practical. I'm so glad that I went to college and learned that. Is, does anybody have anything that they just learned that was so amazing in college that you still use today? Mary, what do you got? Counseling? Okay. The reception is the boss. Perfect. You know what I learned in college that I still use today? When you wash windows, use Windex and newspaper. I was washing my car in college. The guy came along, shared his words of wisdom. I still use it today. What we learned in one phase of life gets us ready for another phase of life. And so often, that's the way it works in life. I'm going to use David and Goliath as my example today. Okay, uh, it's 1 Samuel chapter 17. David uh, is just a little boy. He's just a little shepherd boy. His job, his role, is to take care of the sheep and goat that his father Jesse has. Okay? That's his job. Goliath is a nine-foot-tall giant. Huge giant. Uh, he's nine-foot tall. His, his bronze helmet and his coat of mail that he wears over top of him was like 125 pounds that he just wore to protect himself. Uh, the, the, uh, the spear that he had, the head of it was is 15 pounds just in the head of the spear. And, and the shaft of it, the beam of it was really wide, broad, the word says. Goliath represents our giant that we will face throughout life. Uh, there's so many battles that we have throughout life. And if you're a graduate or in a phase of life, there is battles that you're going to face. And so we're going to walk through this time. Goliath stood and shouted at the Israelite army, daring them, baiting them, trying to get them to engage him. And basically it was like this. Uh, you send your best guy, and I'm the best guy for the Philistines, and we'll meet in the valley down here. One army stood on this side, one army on this side. Goliath would go down and say, hey, send me your best. Instead of all of us fighting, we'll just go one-on-one. -on -one. You send me your best, and if, and if I win, you guys become our slaves. And if you win, we'll become your slaves. And that way they will save a whole lot of bloodshed, and we'll just do it out one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm nine foot tall, Goliath, and I'm baiting the, the Israelites. Come on, show me your best. Come see me, and let's do this. So this went on for 40 days and 40 nights. Every morning he'd come out and say, hey, you ugly uh, whatever, da, 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 yell at them and scream, baiting them, trying to get them to come do battle with him. And this goes on and on. And the Israelite army, they're scared to death. 
they are afraid. Not one man, not one person was willing to take on the battle. They were terrified, gripped with fear. They lost all hope. There's no way. There's no victory in sight. There's no way in the world. And then King Saul offers a huge reward. The reward is, if any man goes and kills Goliath, I will give one of my priceless daughters to be his wife. And also, his whole family won't have to pay taxes for the rest of their life. And he just throws, just keeps sweeten the pot, sweeten the pot. If you, if anybody takes down Goliath, man, what an incentive does King Saul have for them? This huge reward if anyone takes him on and does it. David was the youngest of Jesse's son. Matter of fact, when Samuel, the high priest, came to Jesse's house to anoint the next king, Jesse lines up his oldest son and says, here's my oldest son. Uh, he, you know, I'm sure that's who you're looking for. And Samuel says, no, that's not the one. And the next one, he goes through all seven older brothers, all seven older brothers, and no one is to be awarded, anointed as the next king. Samuel says, no, don't you have anyone else? And Jesse says, yeah, I got, I got my little boy, my little boy, my little runt of the litter, way out in the field, taking care of the, shop, the sheep and the goats. He's out there with his slingshot, playing around in the mud, having fun. We'll bring him out here. So he comes in front of Samuel, and here's this little boy. Samuel says, that's it. He's the one. Uh, First Samuel 16, 17. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge on his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not see the things that the way we see them. People judge on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We always look at the outside, how big, how tall they are. Man, when I'm picking kickball teams, I always look for the guys that got the big legs, right? Uh, when we're picking uh, volleyball teams, we're picking for, I want the big kids, uh, the real tall ones. And we always look at the outward appearance, the color of their hair, the clothes they wear, whatever, their degrees on the walls, all that kind of thing. But I am so glad that God looks at our heart. God looks at our heart. He doesn't disqualify us because we're, Little, tall, short, fat, whatever, all that kind of stuff. He doesn't do that. But he looks at our heart. And our heart is our passion that drives us along the way. If your heart and your passion, for example, is to play sports, for example, you might not be a star on the NBA team. Maybe you're the water boy. Uh, maybe you'll get a job in announcing. I don't know. Maybe you'll become the front, front uh, manager up in the, the big office. I don't know. But when you follow your passion and follow your heart, and uh, you know, you'll end up doing something along that line. Like Bailey uh, wants to be a, a nurse of some type. So she's going to school. So someday she'll be a nurse. Whether she'll be an x-ray tech like her mom or a nurse like her grandmother, it doesn't matter. But she's following her heart. Maybe you want to be a fireman when you grow up. I don't know. Unless life throws you a curveball. Unless life throws you that curveball. You think that's what you're going to do, and then you start off down that trail, and all of a sudden something happens. Maybe you break a leg and you can't play sports anymore. Maybe you're in a car accident. Maybe you get some type of disease. I don't know. And sometimes we think, God what in the world? How did this happen? Or why did this happen type thing? But throughout life, you see God's perfect timing displayed over and over again. We see it in the Word of God as well. Because it happens right here with David and Goliath. It happens right here. God's timing is amazing. And I've seen it in my own life, how God's timing has, you know, I always, always didn't get what I wanted and so many times, but I see I didn't get that because God had something better for me. God had something different for me. God had something already prepared for me down the road that if I would have went that way, it wouldn't have worked out. But God had something better. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, verse 17, one day Jesse says to David, take some bread, roasted grain, and ten loaves of bread, and carry them quickly to your brothers. His brothers are on the front lines at the battle, and David's at home taking care of sheep, and Jesse sends little David to be delivery boy to his older brothers. Give ten cuts of cheese to the captain. A little bribe money, so the captain doesn't put his brothers at the front of the line, so to speak. Uh, see how your brothers are doing. Get along, um, and bring back a report of how they're doing. 
David's brother were with Saul and the Israelites' army in the valley fighting the Philistines. So David is a little guy. He's running. He's bringing snacks and food to his brother. He's going to give some uh, payoff money, some cheese to the captain. And he's hanging out there for a few bit, for a little bit. And while he's there, soon the Israelites and the Philistine forces are stood face to face with each other. Verse 21 uh, then David left his things at the keeper of the supplies and hurried off to the ranks to greet his brother. And as he's there, Goliath, the Philistine champion of Gad, comes out to the Philistine's rank. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelites saw him, just seeing Goliath showing up, they began to run in flight. They begin to run just when Goliath comes walking out. Have you seen the giant? The men ask. He comes out each morning and defies the Israelites. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. And he will give that man his daughter and his wife and his entire family exempt from paying taxes. And David, the little guy, the little boy, he shows up from nowhere. He's talking to his brothers, finding out. And David starts to ask questions. Who is this guy? What's going on? And his brothers are a little bit jealous because they remember that Samuel came along and anointed David, the little pipsqueak of the family, and now he's getting, sticking his nose into this army thing. And what's going to happen next? His older brothers, verse 28, said to David, Why? Why are you doing this? What are you doing around here anyways, they demanded. Well, what about those few sheep that you're supposed to be taking care of? I know that your pride and your deceit and you just want to see the battle. And what have you done? Uh, I'm only asking questions. And, and David goes on. And soon the report gets back to Saul that David is asking questions about this guy named Goliath. And how come we ain't doing battle? And how come we're not taking him on? And I always envision uh, David like a little guy among men. And he's wandering around. He's the littlest guy there. And he, but he's the one with the biggest heart. He's the one with the biggest eyes. He's the one that can look through and see that Goliath is a giant. David got moved to the front of the line, a presence with Saul. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Verse 33, don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way that you can fight that Philistine uh, and possibly win. You're only a boy. You're only a boy. You're only a graduate. You just got out of school. You just finished junior high. You just finished high school. You just finished college. You're only a graduate. You're just a little boy or just a little girl. And David persisted, verse 34. I've taken care of my father's sheep and goats and said, And when the lion and bear has come to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after him with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. The animal turns up. If the animal turns on me, I catch him by the jaw and club him to death. I've done this both with the lion and the bear. There's his resume. I've done this both with the lion and bear. I've done this battle before. I've done this. And I'll do the same to that pagan Philistine too. For if he's defying the army of the living God, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the bears and lion will rescue me from that Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. And may the Lord be with you. David's just a little boy. But all along he's been practicing with the slingshot, preparing for a battle. All along. David doesn't give up on his dream of following God, knowing that the battle is not his, it's the Lord's. David is persistent, and his past experience of taking care of the sheep prepares him for this battle. Gets him ready for this. He's, I don't know, if the Bible doesn't say that he set up 10 cans along the, the, the log. They didn't have 10 cans back then, but clay jars or whatever they had. I don't know if he practiced with them or if he set up little plates or what he did uh, to practice before he went on after the bears and the lions and, and all those other animals that he took on. Uh, I don't know how many times he practiced knocking them down or shooting at wild animals or trying to hit birds or, or anything like that. But Saul, being a military guy, does battle military way, gives David, offers David, tries to get David to wear his armor. 
Here's my helmet. Can you just see Saw with a big fat head of an adult trying to put it on a little kid? You put it on there and he can't even see out of it and it's too clunky and it's rattling around. And then he tries to give him his, his uh, armor and everything else and a sword, which is so big, he can't even hold it. And David tries to take a couple steps and he almost falls down and David takes it off and says, no, I, I can't do it. Let me use what I've been training with. Let me use what I know. Let me use the very thing that has got me to where I'm at. Let me use five stones in my slingshot. I'll take my spear. I'll take my bag. Let me use what I have. I can't use your armor saw. These graduates, they can't use their mom and dad's experience all the time. But mom and dad's been training them, getting them ready for this next phase. Let them use what they know. Let them use what they've been training with. The graduates have been training in school for the last 12, 13 years, some even 14 years, depending on if they went to preschool for a couple of years before they even started. They have no idea what they'll be facing. They have no idea what the battle will be like, what the Goliath will look like when it comes. It might just be a little temptation. It might be a giant like Goliath. It might be so subtle that it lulls them to sleep and Satan grabs them. They don't know what their enemy will look like or how they will face it. When you talk about the enemy, if it was a test, they would study more. If it was a sporting event, they would practice more and condition more. If it was a musical performance, they would practice and be prepared for it. We're going to wait for the train. battles that we will face in the years and days ahead some of them will say look at the battle and others we won't even see it coming at us but we have to be ready how will you fight your battle how will you take on your giant I mean how will you face the enemy that's going to be coming at you because he will come at you how will you do that if it was a test you'd study more you prepare for it. God's word tells us who and what the battle is, who the enemy is. In David's situation, it was Goliath. He was nine foot tall, huge. If the grads were here today, and you can tell them I said this, your parents are not the enemy. Let me just say that again. Your parents, most likely, almost always is not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. And so often we don't see that. We blame other things and other people. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us who the enemy is. It's, it's clear as a bell. It's right there in front of us. All the strategies of Satan, all the strategies of the evil one, that is the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. For we fight not against flesh and blood, not against each other, but against rulers of this evil world, authorities, the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. And there's only one way to win that battle. There's only one way to, to beat that kind of enemy. Through prayer, through the reading of the word of God and applying it to your life, to having a support system of brothers and sisters praying for you, encouraging you, and walking with you. 
worship together, worshiping God, having the belt of truth around your waist to hold everything together and stand firm in the mighty power of God. Now you say, how did David take on a giant like Goliath? You think he won it with five stones and a slingshot, right? But did you hear what I talked about out of 1 Samuel chapter 16? He was anointed by Saul to be the next king. He had the anointing of God. He had the power of God on his life. That's what Ephesians 6 is really talking about, is having God in us, part of us, so we can do battle against the evil one. We can't do it on our own. It's only through the power of God. And that's how David won the battle. Yeah, he took the slingshot and he went down to the river and got the stones. And, and, and matter of fact, as the scripture goes on, as it continued to go on, David runs towards Goliath. Everyone else is fear and running away and hiding when Goliath came out. But David ran towards the battle because he knew that the battle was the Lord's. It wasn't his. He, it, it wasn't him. He was just there being used by God. David runs towards the battle and takes out Goliath. Now, those armor of God things that I talked about, the belt of truth and the helmet of salvation and, and the, the sword of the Spirit and, and pray continuously, those are great weapons, amazing weapons to have. But if you don't know how to use them, they're useless. I have a crossbow. I didn't bring my crossbow. I brought an arrow today. An arrow is a dangerous tool. I can poke my eye out. I might be able to pick up a piece of paper going along the ground like that. I don't know if I could ever kill something with an arrow with my hand. But put the arrow inside a bow and arrow or a crossbow, it becomes a deadly weapon. A lethal, deadly weapon. It could kill a deer. It could kill all, all kinds of stuff. You could go fishing with a crossbow. Okay? But just an arrow by itself and a bow by itself are just dangerous tools. They're really not weapons. They're just dangerous tools. Matter of fact, I bought a new crossbow. I've never harvested a deer with a crossbow. I, I don't practice enough with it. But... Last year, two years ago, I shot at a nice buck and missed it and just scared it away, and it just walked away and, and that type of thing. And every time I go to load my crossbow, I can't remember, do I pull the trigger back and release the safety, or do I release the trigger and pull the safety back? But if you don't do it in the right order, you can't load the arrow. The armor of God, we all have it laying around. It's all around us. It's in the Word of God. But unless we know how to use it, unless we can load it, it's really not very powerful. And if we just have one piece of it, like this arrow and not my crossbow, it's pretty useless. Just like the Word of God. If I just have prayer and I don't have any worship, and I don't have any truth, and I don't have the Word of God, and I don't have family of believers to encourage and strengthen me and pray for one another and all that. If I don't have it to put it all together, it's not very powerful. David had the anointing of God. He took what he knew how to do, a slingshot, and he took on the giant. He went to battle. And David's mindset was two things. Goliath is so big, how can I miss him? He's nine foot tall. How can I miss him? And also, the battle is the Lord. It wasn't his battle. It was the Lord's. So he went after him, and he took him out. We will face battles in life. How will you take him on? How will you take him on? Is worship a regular part of your life? Have you been practicing praying? Have you been applying the word of God? 
Have you been believing and reading the truth of God? And are you able to stand firm in the mighty power of God? Do you run towards your battle or do you run away from your battle? Has fear gripped you so much that you cannot stand? You can't fight your battle because you are gripped with fear. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. When you have Jesus in your heart, he is the one that we turn to. He's the one that fights our battles for us. Goliath was too big to miss as a target. For the graduates, for all of us, are you ready for the next battle, the next step, the next stage of life? My prayer is that Ephesians 6 will be in our hands, on our bodies, in our hearts, in our minds, that will put all the weapons together, not just one of them. So we'll be able to fight the battle that we'll run into in the days ahead. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you have given us your word and how to fight the battle. You've given us the instructions. You've laid it out before us. We pray for our graduates and for each of us as we fight these battles that we will face in the days ahead. Father, I pray for those that are in the midst of a battle right now, that are struggling. Maybe it's physically, maybe it's emotionally, financially, and have nowhere to turn. I pray, Father, that they would turn to you and your word that you'd help them as they fight this battle. Give our graduates wisdom and direction for life. Thank you for what you're going to do and how you're going to work. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. We're going to have communion. Uh, You have to be a member of God's family. Your sin's forgiven. Willing to let God fight your battles for you. Put on the full armor of God. This is how we fight. And you can stand firm when the battle comes. This is how we fight our battle. This is how we fight our battle. You may look like a Jesus, as he was going to the cross, he met with his disciples in the upper room and he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. He said, this is my body of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me.
as they were finishing the Last Supper in the upper room, Jesus took the cup and said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is going to be shed for you and for me, for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and be thankful. Father, we are so thankful that we can be forgiven of our sins, that we can fight by just turning it over to you. We have our part of prayer, knowing the truth, reading the word, fellowshipping with one another. We have our part to do. But the battle is the Lord. And this is how we fight our battle. This is how we do it. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for sending your son Jesus so we can fight the battle that is before us. In the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.